everyone and welcome back to the channel. If it's your first time landing here today, my name is Kathy. If you're one of my regular viewers or subscribers, welcome back to the channel. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I make videos all about life in Australia or Perth specifically as a new arrival, a new expat to this beautiful country. We've been here since April 2022, so October marks our sixth month in Australia and I felt it would be a good time for me to assess what we've learned up until now and today's video is going to be a little bit fun we're going to be sharing some of the things that are quite unusual and unique to Australia that we've encountered and hopefully the video makes these things a little bit less foreign to you and you arrive expecting some of them so you're not caught off guard. If you do enjoy today's video please give it a thumbs up and if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel please do so. I'd love for the channel to reach a thousand subscribers before the end of the year. I'm a stay-at-home mom and this is a great little side hustle for me. I want to just have an outlet that I can be creative on and yeah I really enjoy making content for you guys. It's absolutely free to subscribe, there's no charges so I'd appreciate you supporting in the channel. All right, let's get straight into today's video, guys, which is the 10 things we've learned about being in Australia so far. So straight into today's video, point number one is the unusual pay cycles that we've encountered. So my husband receives his salary every two weeks, so he's on a bi-weekly payment cycle, but things like our water and lights are paid every three months. So you need to be putting away money every pay cycle and then pay every three months for your water and lights or your gas bill might be slightly different gas we pay every month um, your internet is perhaps every month or every two weeks so you've got a lot of different payments due and you need to be on the ball to make sure you don't miss any bills so just make sure that you're aware of that and I would recommend that you set up your budget that you're putting in money every single pay cycle you're putting money into an account to cover expenses that might only come every month every two every three months so just to avoid uh, having to fork out more than you budgeted for if you forget to put aside that money also when you're busy looking for your house or your first time rental often the rents are advertised as weekly but you'll probably end up paying them bi-weekly i guess it is up to you to negotiate that with your rental agent and see what would work best for you admin wise we pay our rent bi-weekly so that we know once the pay cycle is in it goes a direct debit off and the rent is paid and covered for each pay cycle so yeah you just need to do your maths correctly as well when you're shopping around and work out your rent per month or every two weeks, depending on how you get paid. So my second point is to all my fellow parents out there, just a little bit about school or kindy. So our daughter is staying at home still. She's not yet old enough to go to kindy full time. And we've decided that I'll stay home with her until such a time comes. So it's also important to note that we are not on a PR visa, which means we get no childcare subsidy. So for that reason, it is actually more affordable for me to stay home with our little girl. If you do have older children, uh, your children are perhaps of kindy age, children here should be starting kindy the year that they are turning four however they will look at what time in the year your child was born so Nova was born in November um, and if you consider that being the second half of the year she would only start school technically in her fifth year going to kindy versus a child who was born in the first half of 2020 they would be able to start school that year that they are turning four so if your child's born after june they're probably going to be pushed forward to start the following year then the next thing i want to mention about kindy which caught us quite off guard the kindy hours work roughly as 15 hours per week and some schools do this over um, two mornings a week and then the next week three mornings a week or vice versa so you need to just find out which school you're sending your child to and how the kindy hours operate but it's not a full-time childcare. Right, then point number three, something that we've learned, and it's it's really hit home quite hard for us. So our home country is in South Africa, and then we did live in Dubai for five years. And both of those countries did have access to home help or house help, especially when it came to cleaning chores and just keeping up your home. And that is something that is not really affordable for the average family in Australia. So you are going to be doing a lot of house maintenance, a lot of cleaning, especially if you're coming from a country where you're used to a little bit of help. 
from my side, even if you're someone coming from somewhere like perhaps America, where I know everyone does their own housework, keep in mind, you're not going to have that family support around you. So where you might have asked a grandparent or an auntie or uncle to look after your little one while you got seriously into some house cleaning or garden work, you're probably not going to have that kind of help either. So that's been quite a big adjustment for us. And we've really had to look at how we manage our time. We've had to put together quite an elaborate chore list as a couple, because although I'm at home and I do the bulk of the house chores, my husband is still very helpful and we have to sort of tackle it as a team because it's just, it's quite a lot to upkeep your home. And if you're also renting, um, they do do rental inspections. So you have quite a high standard that you have to live up to and make sure that the property is well maintained. Things like weeding, um, pavements, making sure that any plants or landscaping is well maintained and irrigated so that it survives the hot summer months and uh, walls. You've got to wipe your walls down quite regularly because they check for scuff marks and deep cleaning of bathrooms and kitchens. You know how it goes. So just be prepared that it is going to be quite a, a lot of time and energy. And I therefore recommend perhaps considering for your first rental to opt for something as low maintenance as possible. So perhaps something with a smaller garden or perhaps even no garden, perhaps more paving. The parks are wonderful here. So you've got easy access to getting your children out and about that way. And just yeah, to give yourself a bit of a break after a big move that you're not tied up maintaining a super big house by yourself. Right, then the fourth point is going to be a little bit of Aussie slang. So we've encountered a few words that took us by surprise. So chooks is one of them or a chook, that is a chicken. So if you go to your local grocery store and you go to the rotisserie, you'll often hear people asking for a chook, which is quite a, I quite like it. I think it's actually really cute. Then they call flip-flops or beach sandals thongs. So from South Africa, we call them, yeah, we call them flip-flops or slops, but here they're called thongs, so that's a bit different. And we've also heard McDonald's is called Maccas. Um, Straya is a little abbreviation of Australia. So there's tons of slang. I mean, uh, Eski is a cooler box, or I don't know what you would call that in another country, actually. South Africans call them cooler boxes, like an ice box, I guess, would be, I think, the American version of that. So yeah, Eski is another one, and there are still tons more. There are still words that we are learning. So read up a little bit about some Australian slang. It's quite fun, and we're enjoying getting to know these new words. Oh my word, trolleys. Let's talk about the trolleys. So if you go to a store and you're using a shopping trolley, they are incredibly badly behaved here. I don't know why. The wheels just don't go the direction you want them to. Um, shopping with a kid and that trolley is... It's hard work, so just be prepared. They've also got trolley bays, and I strongly recommend you try and park your trolley in a trolley bay after you've used it, because especially on windy days, the trolley is just, they get blown around the parking lots and can damage cars, or they get blown over. So yeah, I know that's a bit of a random comment, but I've had to learn about the trolleys here. Okay, the next one is slightly scary. So this is about the magpies and swooping season. So if you don't know what a magpie is, it's a black and white bird. It looks a little bit like a small crow or maybe a raven. And they tend to be really aggressive during the spring months, early summer months, when they are breeding. So if there is a magpie on its nest, they could aggressively attack you or your child. And there are incidents where children have actually um, sustained damage to their eyes. The magpies actually seem to attack eyes. It's what they target. So if you're driving around the city, um, you'll see some playgrounds or parks or recreational areas have actually got poster boards up with photos of magpies that tend to be more aggressive and they're very territorial so they've cordoned off those areas. Some people if they're going cycling end up putting cable ties on their helmets. I'll insert a picture here for you to see this acts as a deterrent and you start seeing little posters pop up about swooping season. It's a thing. So yeah 
just a heads up about that as parents just be cautious and wary if you do see magpies around and they seem a bit agitated just give them space and make sure your children are not irritating them or going too close to their nests i get this question so many times on social media i have tons of you sending me messages on instagram so i'm going to put it on this video not to scare anyone but yes to confirm australia and perth it, they are snakes and they are spiders and yes we have seen them are um signs everywhere especially when you go to the beaches or parks that tell you you might encounter wildlife snakes etc so we come from south africa my husband and i are both from an area near the kruger national park so we're no strangers to creepy crawlies and snakes and they were sort of part of our childhood so i guess they don't affect us or the thought of them doesn't affect us as much as it would the next person who perhaps grew up in a city but uh our general philosophy is if you are wary and if you are cautious, the snake is not going to come chasing you or looking for you. They're actually pretty scared of humans. So the biggest thing is just to keep your eyes open when you are at the beach or in a reserve. Do smart things like um, when you're in a reserve or going for a hike to wear proper closed shoes. And yeah, just keep a lookout on the ground that you don't step on, on an animal or a snake. Um, then when it comes to spiders, I would strongly recommend that if you have small children or dogs that you might consider spraying a perimeter around your house with uh, insect repellent. So you can purchase these in your grocery stores. I'll insert a picture here of what we've purchased. Generally, I don't like killing um, spiders because they actually they play a really important role in keeping other pests at bay things like flies and mosquitoes they eat those insects and I just really don't like spraying poison because I think it can also affect um, other animals in the ecosystem but because we have a toddler and we're in a new country and we have a dog as well we've just felt that for this first year we are going to take the precaution and spray around our house so yep that's just our decision and each to their own you do you but um, we've, we've made that decision this year we have had quite a few spider encounters around our home already um, not inside the house but outside in our garden area and courtyard and they're quite big so don't be alarmed like they are quite big um, i've identified the main spider that we've encountered it's a wolf spider so generally quite harmless if they bite you, you obviously get a little sting or a it's a little bit painful of course but um it's not a, a deadly spider there are some deadly varieties here so you want to be looking out around your house and garden and obviously if you encounter those types those breeds i think the redback is one of them you would definitely want to consider spraying or fumigating um, to keep your family safe so moral of the story don't bother them they shouldn't bother you and yes they are spiders and snakes and the next point I want to touch on is the low speed on the highways. So coming from South Africa, a sort of highway speed was 120 kilometers an hour. I think that's roughly around 60 miles an hour, maybe a little bit less. Um, but yeah, that was our average sort of highway speed. Then in Dubai, it was 140 kilometers an hour. So that's quite a bit faster. But in Australia, the maximum highway speed we've encountered is around 100 kilometers an hour. And in some areas, it's 80 kilometers an hour. So driving slower on the highways um, is quite strange and it takes on getting used to. But I must say, as a new arrival, it's quite nice that you're not in this very fast paced traffic and you've actually got a little bit of time to ease yourself into what direction you're going in and it's it's a very relaxed driving environment i found at least in perth i can't speak for the likes of sydney or melbourne but i'm finding perth driving is is actually very calm and a lot less stressful coming from Sheikh Zayed road in dubai which is like this massive six lane highway and everyone going so fast um, so that's been refreshing and I find that people here are very courteous drivers as well. People often let you into a lane if you switch your indicator on, they don't try to cut you off. And yeah, I, f I found driving here not intimidating at all. So if you're worried perhaps about driving on the different side of the road, I know from countries like the UAE or America, it is going to be different for you driving on the left hand side of the road. 
we drove on the right hand side of the road in Dubai but on the left hand side of the road in South Africa so it was sort of easy for us but if you're a nervous driver and this is something that's worrying you I recommend just going on a few uber rides with a driver and asking if you can drive in the passenger seat and just see what it's like it's really not intimidating at all and you'll be surprised how quickly your brain shifts to as soon as you're on the different side of the car and you enter a traffic circle you automatically seem to to know which direction is which so don't stress yourself out about it it's really not a big thing to overcome the next point we found quite strange is just the general house layouts so the way that they are designed a lot of the homes we looked at before we chose this one um, have the main or master bedroom at the entryway so you sort of come through the front door and right off to the right or the left is the the doorway or the passage leading to the main bedroom which we found very strange in Australia like um, we were expecting big open homes and I don't know it was just a different experience for us um, and in South Africa our homes were never like that you'd have an entryway which usually leads into the kitchen or lounge like your living space but very rarely would it lead directly to a bedroom so that's been unique and then a lot of the powder rooms that your guests might use sort of the toilet attached to your living space doesn't have a hand basin built into it which is so weird because it means the guest would have to go into the family bathroom to wash their hands after using the toilet, which is just so weird for us. But anyways, it's not a big deal, um, but just something worth mentioning. So when you do start looking at rentals, uh, it's quite the norm. I must say we didn't look at a lot of new builds, so it could be that new designs have changed. But definitely the more traditional or older houses we looked at that seems to be the norm. Something that caught us completely off guard was how far ahead you have to book accommodation if you intend on going on a local getaway in WA. So we wanted to go visit Margaret River over the winter and have a winter getaway. It was impossible. Literally, there were no places available to, to stay. And we've recently tried to do the same again. We felt like going away for the spring. And again, nothing available. Everything's booked up every single long weekend, every holiday. So the general rule here is book up to a year in advance. People have standing reservations where they just book their December holiday a year in advance or their winter getaway a year in advance. So if there are some things and places you want to visit and go do, I'd strongly recommend sitting down with your calendar for the following year and budgeting for deposits and paying those right now. We've actually just sat down two nights ago and booked our winter getaway for 2023. And it's already like we had a very limited selection of accommodation options because they are so booked up already. So we managed to find one, which I'm really excited to go and enjoy. It's a trout farm. There'll probably be a vlog, but um, yeah, book well in advance. And the other option is, and what we're going to be investing in next is some camping equipment. So if you don't want to rely on guest houses or chalets or cabins, then camping is a great option because you'll generally find campsites are available and it doesn't restrict you as to when you can go away. Most weekends, you'll be able to throw your camping gear in the car and head down and set up for a lovely camp. So that's something that we're prioritizing, especially in the new year. We want to get out and about and enjoy the, the bush and just the natural environment a little bit more. And then just lastly, I'll end off with a little bit about buses. So we actually went on an excursion into the city today and we caught a bus. We have a bus stop very close to our house, which is so convenient. And we used our Smart Rider card. I didn't realize my card balance was quite low. So I had to top up and you cannot top up your card uh, with a card. So you need to actually have cash on hand if you do need to top up your card with the bus. Obviously you can pay by card if you're topping up at the actual bus terminals, but I'd strongly recommend if you are going to be using the bus services just to make sure you keep a couple of dollars cash on hand should you run out of cash on your journey on your card. That's it for today's video guys. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope these points come in handy and make your arrival here a little bit less foreign. That's my intention. I just want to share our knowledge and our experience. So if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I'd love to have you as a viewer. I really appreciate you spending some time with me. I'll catch you in the next one.